Welcome to Beyond the Balance Sheet, the podcast that helps advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families understand the complexities of issues related to our mental, physical, and emotional well-being. Our co-hosts, Arden O'Connor and Diana Clark, will interview a series of guests on a range of topics, providing informative content and practical tools for professionals and families to consider. Here are your hosts, Arden and Diana. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Balance Sheet podcast. Our guest, who I'm very excited to speak with, is an OPG colleague, Dr. Colleen Jackson. Colleen received her doctorate in clinical psychology from the University of Connecticut. She pursued a clinical internship in clinical neuropsychology and dementia clinical research at Rhode Island Hospital through the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University, followed by research postdoctoral fellowships in the National Center for PTSD and the Translational Research Center for TBI and Stress Disorders at the VA Boston Healthcare System. After completing postdoctoral training, Colleen assumed a staff neuropsychologist position at the VA Boston Healthcare System, where she was involved in direct clinical care, clinical supervision, mentorship, and research. Colleen served as the chief of the neuropsychology clinic in the Department of Neurology at Boston Medical Center prior to establishing her private practice in 2022. Colleen conducts clinical neuropsychological evaluations with adults presenting with cognitive concerns associated with neurodevelopmental disorders, neurodegenerative conditions, acquired brain, in- acquired brain injuries, substance use, and psychiatric conditions. Whew, say that intro three times fast. <laughs> Welcome, Colleen. It's great to have you. Oh, thank you so much for that introduction, Sam. It's wonderful to be here. Perfect. Now, I know these terms can be confusing, so let's start by describing the difference between neuropsychological testing and cognitive assessments. It's such a great question to to dive into. I think, you know, just to start with, I think sometimes those terms are used interchangeably. um, And so it's not um, uncommon for clients or patients to have different healthcare team members who are referring to neuropsychological evaluation or cognitive testing. When I think about those two terms, um, I think the the cognitive testing piece often refers to paper and pencil uh, measures or perhaps computerized measures that are designed to look at different aspects of cognition or thinking abilities. So that might be things like memory, attention, ability to use language, et cetera. Um, Now, in a neuropsychological evaluation, we're absolutely using those kinds of paper and pencil measures or computerized measures, and we're often also including other measures that are looking at someone's mood, um, perhaps their day-to-day functioning, and often we may include questionnaires or measures that are asking for input from friends or family who know that person well to get their sense of what might be going on. And so I think it can be helpful to think about cognitive assessment or neurocognitive assessment as really focusing on the, the aspects of thinking piece, whereas a neuropsychological evaluation includes more. Um, I'll also add, Sam, some, for some of some of the clients at OPG, you may hear your healthcare team member referring to cognitive assessment as something that they're doing in the office. So perhaps it's a brief set of questions um, that are designed to take a quick look at those aspects of thinking that I mentioned earlier. And that team member may then use that information to make a referral for more extensive testing with a neuropsychologist. Yeah, no, thanks for that clarification too, because I know when I first started off in this field, I was like... This sounds like this or it's that, but it can be somewhat interchangeable. And yeah, no, thank you for that clarification. Will you talk to us about what the tests look like and what's involved? Sure. So, you know, I think it's important for folks who are coming in for cognitive testing or neuropsychological evaluation to first understand that this is often part of getting a better sense of what might be going on for them. So I often will hear from from clients that um, it can be somewhat anxiety provoking to come in and meet with a specialist who's going to ask them different questions, um, especially if that person already has some concerns or maybe family members are expressing concerns about their thinking. So I think it's important to, to sort of right off the bat, try to put them at ease and let them know that this is really designed to serve them, to help them and their team get a better sense of what might be going on. 
Um, now, for an outpatient neuropsychological evaluation, I'm often meeting with clients for somewhere between two to four hours. And I know that can sound like a long time. So I often like to let folks know that up front. I know this sounds like a long appointment and it is, um, but that's really to help me have the time with that person to really get to know them. Um, so usually there's a period of somewhere between half an hour to an hour where we're just talking. And I'm, I'm my goal there is to really get a sense of um, what they're noticing, perhaps what others in their life might be noticing, um, as well as to get a detailed history. And then we'll transition into that cognitive testing that we talked about just a moment ago, um, where we're doing different kinds of um, questions and answers, many verbal, some are written, and some might even be on the computer. Um, and for each of the different tasks, I, I want to take time to explain to the person what's being asked of them, answer any questions, and make sure that they feel confident in what we're doing before we move ahead. Um, so that's usually the day of the evaluation. Now, after that, I take some time to review everything um, after the individual has left. Um, I'm, we're fortunate with our neuropsychological measures that we have large databases that we can compare someone, an individual's performance to sort of their peers. So individuals who are of a similar age, often a similar educational background. Um, and that can give us some helpful information about where that person is performing relative to other people like themselves. Um, and so usually within a week or two, I will invite that person either back to the office or perhaps we'll speak over the telephone or video and we'll go over the results. And I'll talk a little bit about sort of where their performances were relative to other people like themselves, um, as well as kind of looking and speaking a little bit more deep in more detail about their patterns of performance. Um, and I think that's an important point, Sam, is we're never waiting any one particular measure or a low performance um, as, as really, um, we don't want to overweight that. We don't want to give it too much say. We're really looking at how, how the pattern of performance, as well as that person's clinical history, might help us get a better sense of what's going on for them. Yeah. And when you talk about it can be anxiety provoking. Do you have any tips or tricks for family members to encourage their loved ones to go get an assessment and, and see a provider? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think one of the first things is to really make sure that um, at, at either the individual level or family le level, you're comfortable with the provider um, and different providers are going to have different styles, different sort of interpersonal approaches. And so I think finding someone that you and your loved one are going to feel comfortable with is really important. Um, the other piece is, again, reminding the individual that this is really in service of them. This is to help them and their healthcare team better understand how they're performing from a cognitive standpoint, as well as, and I, I can't uh, emphasize this enough, Sam, as well as to, to come out of this process with some really useful and individualized recommendations for them. So that's that's something that I always want to, to emphasize with, with my clients is that we're not doing this just for the sake of doing it or for gathering data. We want to make those individualized recommendations that are going to help them on their journey. Yeah. And I know we'll talk a little bit later about the recommendations. And I think it's so important to, you know, we, we have clients at OPG who are resistant to care. They're scared because of what the results might show, but going through this can really help improve the quality of life. So it's important to get, you know, see what's happening. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. So we tell our listeners what you were hoping to learn from these evaluations. Sure. So, you know, I think different um, different clients are going to come in with different sort of questions and in terms of what they're looking for, what their healthcare team and, and family might be looking for from the evaluation. So when I'm working with older adults, often part of the question is some type of observation that this individual's thinking abilities have changed over time. Maybe they're having more difficulty remembering recent information. Um, maybe they're having difficulty with more complex tasks like managing their finances or remembering to take medications. And so often there's a question of, are these changes part of what we might call sort of typical aging? Is it sort of part of what we expect as someone gets older? Or does it represent something different? And perhaps part of uh, one of the big fears, I think, for many of my older adult clients is that this represents some type of neurodegenerative condition, perhaps something like Alzheimer's disease. 
Um, and so I think that's often you know, part of what we're looking at um, when I'm meeting with an older adult is, you know, does the way that they perform on the standardized measures that I'm giving them, as well as what they're describing in terms of their clinical history, does that sound like it's in alignment with um, some type of neurodegenerative condition, or is this perhaps more uh, part of kind of typical aging? I think for other adults who come in for neuropsychological testing, the questions might be different. Um, and that can often depend on their unique um, medical circumstances, whether they've had different medical conditions or events in their life, such as a traumatic brain injury or stroke that have resulted in changes in thinking. Um, I also see adults who in adulthood are wondering whether perhaps they have different types of neurodevelopmental conditions. So things like uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or autism spectrum disorder. And while we often think of those conditions as being diagnosed in childhood, more and more we're seeing adults who are coming in and wondering whether this is part of their clinical picture. Oh, 100%. And actually, I was talking with a client not too long ago whose son was going in for testing and um, turned out to have ADHD. And she's like, I have a lot of these symptoms. This is so she has clarity now, like, oh, there's, you know, so it was. Yes. Relief. Yes. That's, and that's a great point, Sam, is it, you're right. It, it's often the, the loved ones, the, the, the parents, the family members, older siblings who recognize, oh, you know, this sounds a lot like what I struggle with, or this sounds like some of the things that I'm encountering. I wonder if I might benefit from t testing as well. Yeah, no, 100%. So what are some conditions or illnesses you can identify or discover from these assessments? Sure. So Sam, I'd say one of the, the things I often like to let clients know is that neuropsychological evaluations are typically part of a bigger puzzle of data that is often being kind of collected in service of understanding the individual. So most often, um, and I'll maybe speak a little bit about older adults in particular, but most often when someone perhaps goes to their primary care provider or their neurologist, um, their healthcare team member might recommend that they get some labs done, they perhaps go for an, a brain MRI, and maybe they come to see someone like myself who will do some standardized neuropsychological testing. Um, and so I think understanding the role for neuropsychological evaluations in the context of this broader um, picture, this broader set of data that's being collected to all really inform um, and kind of be, be brought together to better understand the individual's presentation. That being said, I do think that um, neuropsychological evaluations can be very helpful in identifying patterns of difficulty that are prototypical for different kinds of conditions. So, for example, I think Alzheimer's disease can be one that, again, is, is often worried about and talked about a lot in, in amongst older adults. And for, for that, we're often seeing individuals who are having particular difficulties on tasks that involve memory, um, often memory for recently learned information. Um, and I think that's an important piece is that people, people know, may be able to remember things that happened to them earlier in adulthood or in childhood, but they're having a harder time remembering things that happened more recently. Um, and so oftentimes that's sort of one of the, the hallmark um, signs that we might see on testing, but we might also see some other difficulties, things like um, more difficulty taking in visual information and making sense of it. Um, sometimes that can translate into uh, family members or loved ones who are having difficulty getting lost or driving to previously um, familiar places. And so often we're sort of seeing on the standardized testing some of the types of difficulties that we're also hearing about in the clinical interview as people describe the kinds of changes that they're noticing. Yeah, I bet it provides such clarity and peace of mind for the family members as well. I know uh, I heard a story not too long ago of an individual who had a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. She was still driving. So the family was trying to take away the keys and she had to go for her driving test. And like, this is it. She won't pass her driving test. And she went to the DMV did the driving test, but her um, she got she actually got lost on the way to the car with the instructor. But when she got into the car, her 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 skills took over muscle memory, brain memory, and she drove fine and she passed it to the amazement of her family. Like, how did this happen? But yeah, it just it's that short term memory kind of 
Yes, yes. And I and I, I think that's such a great example, Sam, of actually some of the ways that our measures don't perfectly align always with some of the day-to-day abilities. Um, and, and that's actually an area of continued research is how can we make these standardized paper and pencil or computer measures uh, match up a little bit better to the kinds of requirements that people are asked to engage in, whether it's with driving, uh, managing finances, remembering to take their medications, uh, because we know that there sometimes can be these mismatches where we see on testing someone is having very significant memory difficulties, maybe very significant visual spatial difficulties, and yet they drive and they pass their driver's tests. And and I think to your very point, often the loved ones in those situations are extremely concerned and, you know, really struggling with what to do and how to keep their, their family members safe. Oh, 100%. And it's interesting too, because I know it just, it's really depends on what part of the brain is impacted as well, because you may be language wise, be okay, but you know, and, and other areas, not so much. So you can kind of dance around the issues. Um, yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. Yeah. Will you describe some of the treatment recommendations you provide based on the test results? Absolutely, yeah. So as I mentioned before, I think the the reason that I do these types of evaluations is for those recommendations. I want my clients to walk away from a neuropsychological evaluation with a better understanding of how how their brain is working, how their thinking abilities are, um, but also what to do next. Um, and so in that vein, I'm often thinking about a couple of different Um, buckets, so to speak. So one often involves sort of um, a focus on their their, um, health, their physical health. And so in that vein, if they're not already connected to a neurologist, I may recommend that they follow up with a neurologist for sort of the standard neurological evaluation, uh, perhaps labs, recommendation for an MRI, etc. Um, I'm often also discussing the importance of cardiovascular health. And this is something that surprisingly does not get nearly enough attention um, in certainly in my visits to to my primary care provider. I don't know about you, Sam, but, um, you know, we know that the heart, that heart health and lung health is so important for our overall physical health. Um, And one of the points that I'm often making with my clients is that it's incredibly important for your brain health. And so one of the best things that you can do to keep your brain healthy is to keep your heart healthy. And that means getting regular physical activity, eating a healthy diet. Um, Oftentimes we talk about the so-called Mediterranean diet. So maybe you've heard of that one, Sam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and the, the mind diet, the combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. Yes. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, oftentimes, especially if someone um, is feeling a little bit overwhelmed with information, what I just try to, to emphasize is healthy foods. We want fresh fruits and vegetables, lean meats, healthy fats, and really steering clear of those more processed foods and high sugar foods. Yeah. Well, it goes, it also helps with like uh, gut health too and inflammation because inflammation leads to other disease processes. And so if you're reducing inflammation in the body, that can help provide some clarity and just overall a better well being and, and health, overall better health. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, and so that often tends to be sort of an area where I think my clients aren't expecting that we're going to be spending time talking about. They didn't think that they were coming to see a clinical neuropsychologist to get some recommendations about physical activity and, and their diet. But I do think that that is so incredibly important, um, particularly when we're talking about brain health. Um, I also will make recommendations around um different types of cognitive compensatory strategies that might help that individual. Um, And so those can include things like um, using calendars and to-do lists, using alarms, um, either external alarms or alarms on someone's phone to help remind them to do things. Um, And all of these are intended to really help support the independence and safety of the individual. And that's really how I frame that is we want to keep people functioning at as an independent level as they can while also maintaining maintaining their safety. Yeah, it's such a holistic approach to that. Not many providers take, which I appreciate that you talk about that because I know, you know, working with various PCPs that and with clients, you know, just like, well, let's look at this picture. Let's look at this. Let's 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 broaden the, the view. Um, 
so just to provide a better standard of care. <laughs> yes. And that's, I honestly, Sam, that's one of the things I love most about my job is that it allows me to take that step back to really appreciate the person as a whole um, and to sort of obviously staying sort of within my scope of practice, but to make recommendations um, and or to connect them with other people who will be able to, um, you know, make additional recommendations or further their work up um, in ways that are going to be really helpful for that person. Yeah. Wonderful. So is there a question you think is important that I haven't asked you? Well, I guess, Sam, one thing that we haven't talked about that I would love to maybe just spend a minute on is talking a little bit about mental health in the context of neuropsychological evaluations and cognition. Um, and I think this can be um, a tremendous piece of the puzzle that often can be overlooked, um, particularly amongst older adults, because um, we're, we're often in the in the healthcare space, so kind of cued into the possibility for neurodegenerative conditions that we have the potential to overlook things like depression that might have cognitive, uh, an impact on someone's cognitive performance in their day-to-day -day life. They may be more forgetful. They might be more distracted. Um, they might have a little bit more difficulty carrying out things that they used to do with ease. Um, and so I think making sure that uh, clients at OPG, certainly something I'm talking about with my, my private practice clients is, what has your mood been like? Have you noticed changes in how you've been feeling? Um, and I think oftentimes, additionally with older adults, we're looking at folks who are retiring or stepping back from some of the activities that they used to once be very involved in. And we know that that can have an impact on mood. So I think bringing that, that piece in um, is very, very important. Certainly something that I I'm often thinking about in this neuropsychological evaluation space. Well, definitely. When you talk about people retiring, they lose their sense of purpose or their drive. So then it can lead to depression. But then with depression, it's the most underdiagnosed illness in older adults. Um, and like the, the signs and symptoms do correlate a lot with dementia. So it's kind of like, well, what's going on here? And then I don't know. Have you seen in your practice people suffering from cognitive impairment, um, but it's due to an underlying other illness, maybe it's it's a, an infection or dehydration or, or fluid in the brain. Yes, that's, and that's actually, I, I'm so glad you asked that question, Sam, because that's an area where I think neuropsychological testing um, in conjunction with sometimes an MRI, which can also help to kind of clarify whether there are structural changes going on in the brain, um, fluid accumulation, etc. But Having objective measures of cognition can become so helpful in really clarifying um, some of these other sort of more systemic or medical illnesses that have the potential to impact cognition. Um, I think about someone that I saw a number of years ago who performed much lower on testing than I, I would have expected given sort of how they've been functioning, what they, what they um, had done for much of their adult life. And we went on, they ended up uh, not feeling well. And we, we made the recommendation that they follow up with their healthcare provider. It turns out that they had a, a systemic illness that resulted in hospitalization and, and sort of the, there was a, a, an underlying um, metabolic changes that were impacting their cognition. And once that was stabilized and they felt much better, we, you know, we waited for a period of time and we had them back for repeat testing, which gave us a much better picture of where they were actually at cognitively. It's such a great example and just another reason why it's important if you are experiencing some cognitive impairment or not feeling well to, to get tested. Don't push it out. Like, just find out what's going on. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, you know, I think sometimes one of the things that can hold folks back is what I was talking about earlier as far as the length of these evaluations. And one thing that I've I've really worked with with clients, especially in my practice, is to to recognize that not all people need a four-hour evaluation. Um, and there's the ability to really tailor these evaluations to answer specific questions or to provide sort of what I call snapshots of the person's cognitive abilities at this particular time with the ability to then use that information to make some strategic recommendations, whether it's Let's connect you with a neurologist who can do a little bit more on the medical side. Let's connect you with a mental health specialist who can perhaps work with you to improve your symptoms of depression. And then let's take another look and see where things are at in 
three, six, nine months and take it from there. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's, you know, the wait list though, too, it's great that you can meet the person's needs. Cause I know I hear the horror stories. It takes maybe six months, six months to nine months to even get an appointment for an assessment. So I'm so grateful that you're out there and providing these services. So yeah. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Yes, no. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you for being here today. It's been a great honor to speak with you. For our listeners of Beyond the Balance Sheet podcast, please like us on your favorite platform of choice. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Balance Sheet, a podcast designed to help advisors, clinical professionals, and affluent families solve some of their biggest medical, psychiatric, and emotional challenges. Visit beyondthebalancesheet.com to read more about our guests and resources and sign up for our newsletter.